Well, let me then wish you a very warm welcome uh, to the Social Contract Research Network seminar series. Um, I wish to acknowledge the people of the cooling nations uh, on whose land some of us are today. And uh, I acknowledge their elders, uh, past, present and emerging. And it is also my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, my colleague at Monash University, Associate Professor Janice Richardson. Uh, Janice worked as a solicitor before entering academia and uh, as an undergraduate, uh, so it has graduate degrees, both in law uh, and in philosophy. Uh, she specializes in the overlap between feminist and political philosophy and the law. In particular, she's interested in questions of the self and personal identity. In addition to editing two collections and authoring a wide range of journal articles, she's published three single authored books, uh, Selves, Persons, Individuals, Philosophical Perspectives on Women and Legal Obligations in 2004, The Classic Social Contractarians, Critical Perspectives from Contemporary Feminist Philosophy and Law in 2009, and Law and the Philosophy of Privacy in 2016. And it's the second of these books that particularly concerns us here today. Uh, no one can have failed to notice over the past 12 months or so, the proliferation of calls for a new social contract. Everyone from the UN Secretary General to Joe Biden to Scott Morrison to Extinction Rebellion are using social contract language today. And therefore, it is more crucial than ever that we examine this concept uh, particularly with an eye to its assumptions and its prejudices. And Janice's book provides a brilliant example of this sort of critical engagement with the social contract tradition, tracing the status of women through the work of classic social contract theorists and highlighting both the opportunities and the deficiencies of this concept of the social contract. Uh, Janice will talk for around 50 minutes today, uh, after which time there'll be uh, a a period for question and answer and discussion. If you'd like to ask a question, you can write it in the chat at any time. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll call on you to ask your question viva voce to our speaker. Uh, so please do join me in welcoming Janice Richardson, whose title for today is Feminist Perspectives on Social Contract Theory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you for that hand there. <laughs> um, okay, before I begin, I'd just like to say that, of course, there are a number of feminist philosophers who've written on this issue, post, um, both historically and today. And what I'm going to do is pick out two, in particular, the work of Carol Pateman, um, because I think it provides a radical political philosophy and also guidance in terms of sort of pragmatic ways forward. Um, but also I'd like it towards the end really to talk a bit about Jean Hampton's uh, position, which in some ways is less radical, but I think it's interesting in that it's focused on philosophizing about people who are trained in subordination and thinking around those issues. So, in both cases, I'm focusing uh, upon women, but of course it raises other issues, uh, particularly with regard to, to race. Now, Pateman's written about uh, the racial contract, but I'm focusing really on her 1988 work particularly and getting the conceptual framework that she uses to engage with the um, classic social contract theorists. So Carol Pateman, um, and the way I've done it is to break down what I think are perhaps the three most important or the three most important for me, um, themes really in her work, and then go through those themes. And that's how I've structured it. And so the first theme is um, the way she examines what she sees as an important contradiction at the heart of the 17th and 18th century social contract theorists. How is it, she asks, with the notable exception of Hobbes, that they make a really radically progressive move um, that hierarchy is just like a convention? And yet also don't, um, 
justify or try <laughs> to justify men's domination over women as natural. Um, so that's the first theme. The second theme is the way that she draws together, <coughs> excuse me, um, an analysis of legal relationships between sovereign and subject, employer and employee, or these days we're calling them workers, precariat, they're losing so many rights, well losing so many rights, and with traditional heterosexual cis husband and wife. So it's those three relationships, legal relationships, that she focuses on and draws together to analyze together. Um, and, what, and the reason that she's doing that is to set up her argument that when you get a move from status to contract in modernity, it's through contract that subordination is managed. Uh, and of course, it's a specific sort of contract that she's looking at, of course, one that forms relationships, not a one-off exchange, and ones that involve um, what she calls the fiction of the exchange of property and the person. So that's the second theme. And then that second theme leads really onto my third scheme, um, theme, which is the importance of freedom in Pateman's work. Um, and of course, Pateman's view of freedom is a positive one, uh, that you're free if you have a voice in the decisions that affect your everyday life. Okay, so what I'm going to do is structure by looking at those three themes. Starting, of course, with the first one, unconventional like that. How is it that uh, contract theorists in the 17th and 18th century, apart from Hobbes, held this progressive view that um, hierarchies occur through convention, but then that uh, men's domination over women is viewed as natural. So I'm going to start with Hobbes, the exception to draw this out, because Pateman points out, she says that Hobbes lets the cat out of the bag, great phrase, that she's so rigorous that in his state of nature, a state envisaged prior to law, men and women are equal. The claim is that the world works as if, um, oh, I should say before I start, the point I wanted to stress is that these are stories. Um, the claim is that the wor world works as if there were a social contract in which individuals in a state of nature agreed to create and obey a sovereign. And Hobbes, of course, is providing us with a cautionary tale about the need to obey the law in the context of the horrors of the English Civil War. So we're talking about different stories, but they're still really important stories. So unusually, Hobbes opens up the possibility of gender equality in the way that he envisages the state of nature, a state without laws. Um, men and women, he argues, are not so different in wit or strength that men could subordinate women in this natural state prior to law. After all, if you think about it, everybody's got to sleep and eat and it makes them vulnerable. In Hobbes' state of nature, women can join with others who are similarly situated or by path and run away. So it's a fascinating view of equality that he's got here, a particularly materialist and sort of very practical one about whether you can enforce subordination uh, that he provides in 1651. As a result, Peckman's able to point to an inconsistency in Hobbes, otherwise rigorous, uh, rigorously argued tale. Why should women who envisage as free and equal in the state of nature agree to join a social contract in which the sovereign enforces law that allows men to dominate them. And I'll just flesh out that argument there. You'll recall that Hobbes' argument for the social contract is that life in a state of nature is nasty, brutish and short. And the sovereign, if you form a social contract, have, uh, have a sovereign, the sovereign will enforce contracts through the operation of law. If we know that our contracts will be enforced by the sovereign, the argument goes, 
then we won't worry about um, fulfilling our side of the contract first. Um, we know it will be enforced. So this all, he said, Hobbes says, facilitate cooperation, allowing industry, the arts and letters to flourish. We may be envisaged as individualistic and selfish in the face of limited resources, but both men and women are viewed as rational and able to improve their lives by recognizing the need for social contract, the need for sovereign and for law. So Pateman asks of Hobbes' story, why should women envisaged as free and equal in the state of nature join a social contract as a result of which the sovereign would impose the marriage contract, because that's what sovereigns do. They impose the law and impose contract. It's central to his arguments. So in Hobbes, 17th century England, the marriage law wasn't looking so great for women um, to, to enter into a contract to allow that to occur, because, of course, it was based on the doctrine of coverture in which women were treated as it enforced a subordinate status. As the jurist Blackstone later described the legal doctrine in his commentaries on the north of England, um, 1765 to 1769, but it's the same doctrine of coverture, quote, by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband. Um, the doctrine of coverture prevented women being able to sue in the courts or hold property. Great for trust lawyers if they were rich enough, but not looking great for women generally. Um, and she was subordinate to her husband who could beat her. Um, bear in mind that Hobbes wasn't making a claim that his cautionary tale was connect, correct. He was giving a radical justification for the need to obey the law or end up in this brutal state of nature. This allows Pateman to make a move that I think is often misinterpreted against her, that the social contract from the 17th century worked as if the social contract also included with it a hidden sexual contract, which made women subordinate to men to be envisaged as the objects of the contract rather than equal participants in creating it. Uh, it was to get access to, to women. In other words, the, through the, the doctrine of, of COVID or such, such laws. Um, now it's a rhetorical move that Pateman makes. And of course it doesn't mean that women have had it, you know, for all time, that women can't make contracts, they clearly can, or anything about contracts are set in stone, or that women's subordination is inevitable, of course not. Um, it's an intervention in a story that's told as political theory by considering and trying to highlight its effects. We also need to be careful about the use of the term patriarchy in this context. The 17th century social contractarians successfully attacked the claim that there was a natural hierarchy in general um, by starting with the image of free and equal individuals, including women in the, in the case of Hobbes. These classic social contractarians therefore won out over the view that there was a divine right of kings to rule. In doing so, you could say that they were undermining, quote, patriarchal claims, um, particularly of Filmer, based on the right of fathers to rule. So you could say, crudely, that Filmer's argument was lost to Locke's attack on it in the first of the two treaties of government in 1689. So in that sense, the classic social contractarians could be described as successfully opposing patriarchy in the, form, in the form of Filmer's argument for the divine right of kings based on the claim from Adam onwards that fathers have this divine right to rule, um, hence patriarchy. Uh, Pateman proposes in her story that this overthrow can be envisaged as it were through a rule of brothers, 
So it's just a bit of caution about the term patriarchy as it's used in various senses. But before getting too complex or psychoanalytic about this, I just want to stress, heaven forbid, I just want to stress that uh, this is a story, albeit a powerful one, <clears throat> that's being rethought with the retoffel device. Turning from Hobbes to Locke, Locke, if you like, puts the cat back in the bag. Locke closes down Hobbes' view that women are to be viewed as equal in the state of nature. And to justify this, she, she argues, Locke distinguishes between the power of sovereigns and the power of husbands, claiming that these are two different types of power. This addresses the contradiction that I'm focused upon in this section directly, um, or this theme. As Peckman points out, the move allows Locke to argue that sovereign power of subjects is by convention, uh, but the different um, power of husbands within the home uh, is actually natural and takes place in his state of nature. And she focuses on this public-private divide more broadly, arguing that it's how liberals come to justify um, the, some of the arguments about women. So in the public sphere, as citizens, men and women later become treated as equal in law, as you gradually get rid of status relationships. Um, and note this, of course, um, as the, the lawyers here, well, and others will recognise that this took place through a long struggle uh, to get the vote, to get the right to be part of the professions, including 60 years of the person's cases, during which time common law male judges claimed that women were not to be classified as persons. And they were actually congratulated by the press when they'd actually made it to be classified as persons on the progress they'd made, as if it wasn't about uh, holding them down, but it, in some idea that they'd ontologically kind of made it through some barrier. Um, that's the public sphere. What occurs in private was supposed for many years, and sometimes I think still is, to be viewed as non-political, including domestic violence and women's double day of work, both within and outside the home. And it was within Peyton's career that uh, uh, political theorists didn't really, and we could say this one maybe continuing, but didn't really recognize feminist work as part of mainstream political theory. Relying, she's arguing, on this public-private side. So I'd like to give kind of a flesh this bit out a bit more as well. Um, so, for example, rules in 1971, when we're looking at political theory, envisages male heads of household as meeting under the veil of ignorance, and so uh, there's something of a, <coughs> a contradiction there to the. Um, it's acute of listening here, um, given veil of ignorance and a position with regard to male heads of household. And of course, that's very well demonstrated by Susan Moller Otkin and, and then accepted by rules. Similarly, there's no discussion of race. And it's Charles Mills in the racial contract who added the argument that if those deciding on a society under a veil of ignorance, risk being black and subject to Jim Crow laws, then clearly nobody would want this. And you can see the illegitimacy of those laws. I'd also like to give a legal example um, of women's place in the home being treated as private and non-political in ways that denied them legal relief. In the rule of love, wife beating as prerogative and privacy, Reva Siegel traces US common law case law, judge made law, um, at the point when feminists and the temperance movement um, challenged what was a husband's prerogative to beat his wife to that status relationship, um, provided there was no permanent injury 
And this gradually becomes something that seems consistent with the view of the sentimental marriage in the 19th century, which is still one in which it's viewed as being between um, unequals. But the idea was that wives would obey because of sentiment and love rather than force. And it's difficult to maintain the idea of a husband's prerogative to beat his wife, whilst you're also trying to uh, preach about the idea of a sentimental marriage. Um, so after some pressure here, uh, US common law judges um, decide, you know, as they do, um, that husband's prerogative to beat his wife was no longer to be good law. And I would think that was a, a move forward. Um, but what happens uh, that Siegel traces really cleverly through the case law is at the point at which this right, this prerogative of husbands to beat their wives was threatened, judges um, provided a more acceptable ground to maintain it. So the way Siegel expresses it was that there was pre preservation of the legal right of husbands to beat their wives through transformation of the law. And the way they squared it was to say that uh, it was better for marriage if the courts allowed families to, quote, draw the curtains and maintain the privacy of the couple rather than to provide legal relief for the battered wife. So the, particularly it was based on both class and race as well, um, because the emphasis was on the husband's governance in the home and the idea that the husband's governance of the home shouldn't be opened up to public comment, uh, particularly with regard to white upper class men, because that would shame them. Um, the only exception that you get within the case law that she, she cites is with regard to a form of black, well, two forms married, form of black slaves. Um, they, uh, they find that uh, um, for the woman, basically, but it's clearly from what they say in the, the judges say in the justification on the case um, that it's not because of concerns for the beaten woman, but that they don't envisage a former black slave as being the governor of his household. And in a way, looking at this, I was trying to think how it fitted with uh, Locke or Hobbes. And I think this emphasis on privacy, obviously the judges in their judgment don't discuss Locke or Hobbes, um, but it strikes me that even though you've got that Hobbes move of a sort of the family seen as a mini state, what you have also is this emphasis on privacy, uh, the papers emphasizing it from Locke. And it seems to fit, it seems to me it fits more with Locke's distinction between a sovereign's power and the power of husbands, the way he distinguishes them. Because the laws of the state have to be published. I mean, from some words, they, people need to know what the laws are. And so they're public. But the governance of the household is viewed as private. It's taking place behind these um, closed curtains, to use the, uh, the terms that the judiciary used. Um, and that fits with um, the point of this, this theme, that the question of how they managed to make this distinction between um, seeing women's subordination within the home as natural, and yet being so progressive in other areas. Um, and this is Pavement's argument that I'm using this case law as an example. Um, that it's one is by uh, convention and one's natural because they're viewed by Locke as two different types of power. Okay. <laughs>
Moving on to the second theme then, the linkage between governance in the household as compared with governance performed by the sovereign uh, brings me to the second point about Pateman's theor theoretical analysis of the social contract. Um, and I've summarised this in my brief introduction by saying, Pateman draws together an analysis of three relationships, those between sovereign and subject, employer and employee, hus traditional husband and wife. Um, she's saying the heyday of that was the 1840s to 1970, but we still see elements of this. Um, and she draws together these relationships to argue that uh, when you get a shift from status relationships in which the law treats certain groups of people differently depending on status, to um, if you think of Maine, to, from status contract to contractual relationships, then it's through contract that subordination is managed. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's a specific type of contract that we're talking about. It's not one off exchanges, it's about the exchange of property in the person. As I'll discuss further in a moment, property in the person refers to the, uh, as she calls it, political fiction, you could say legal fiction, that we can exchange human abilities for money as if an ability of commodities. It's a fiction because I can't chop my arm off, send it into the university and expect to be paid. Um, and it shouldn't be confused with um, those parts of the body that, that can be sold, that can be alienated from you, such as uh, blood. Uh, so here it's about human abilities, particularly the uh, ability to work. And you can see the same structure in each of these relationships. Employer. Ease have to turn up to some of the traditional wives exchange consortium, which I say rather crudely as sex and housework for material support, an area that's often occluded and which Pateman adds to McPherson's and Marx's arguments. <coughs> In the fictional social contract, it's envisaged that individuals become subjects of a sovereign who exchange obedience to the sovereign's law for security or for justice, if you think about that. <coughs> it's, it has been sorry about this. Okay, it sometimes comes as a shock to law students, if I inflict this upon them, um, that these three relationships are discussed together. They seem odd. One's categorised as legal theory, so I'm not even giving them a proper contract. And the other two, you know, um, and the other two are categorised in law courses in entirely different areas, family law and employment law. And they're not in compulsory core subjects either. Now contract is compulsory, but tends to be analyzed in terms of the one off exchange, rather than exchanges that create relationships in which one party has historically been subordinate in status in law. And I think she's right to bring these together and talk about them together. And I'm very briefly, um, sketch updated positions and then draw together Payton's arguments and her image of a better society. Now, I know I promised Cathy Weeks and David Graber, but sadly, uh, I'm going to, you'll have to ask me that later. Okay, firstly, sovereign and subject. In the influential story of the social contract, individuals who are usually men, and in Payton's rereading, always men with regard to the sexual contract, in a state of nature envisaged as agreeing to create a sovereign, binding themselves to obey future as yet unknown laws. Like employment and marriage contracts, the political struggles over the limits of, of the contract. 
as Spinoza in the 17th century points out, no one so transfers his natural right to another that in the future there's no consultation with him. Moreover, no one contracts for the future unless he assumes that certain circumstances will prevail. If these circumstances change, then the nature of the whole situation changes. So he's being critical at that point. Um, today, the image of voters from the aisles of democracy that we associate with Kantian enlarged mentality taken up by Habermas, in which you have this wonderful ideal image of the public being able to put aside differences and be informed by another's point of view to address a shared problem. Instead, of course, we've got fake news, thoughts that disrupt communal thought in keeping with the ideas and seeing ourselves as owners of property in person, uh, we get marketed to political parties with progressively sophisticated uh, tools as we're being marketed goods. Just turning briefly to uh, employment contracts, I'll just pause, I'm sorry about this, for one second. <laughs> Sorry about that, struggling slightly. It's just the thought of where employment contracts are today. You know, it makes me want to go and blow my nose. Okay, so employment contracts. Robert Castell, <clears throat> in his For Manual Workers to Wage Labourers, Transformation of the Social Question, provides a fascinating study of the gradual transition, which, you know, in a lot of its complexity, from status relationships to employment relationships. Although I think it's a mark of the importance here of Peyton's insight, that he doesn't really mention the other side, the associated marriage contracts, and marriage contracts tend to, to fall from view. Linked, I think, she's right, with regard to this public-private split that we get. Um, so the employment contracts, continuing on employment contracts, the employment contract, like the social contract, is around the regulation of the weaker party, in quotes. I mean, in some ways, it's the creation of, of the weaker party, such that he or she doesn't know the precise details of the agreement. Um, workers are regulated by the state and the use of implied terms. Today, there's an implied term in employment contracts that employees must obey reasonable commands. Unless the matter's subject to interpretation by tribunals and courts, of course, it's the employer who decides what's reasonable. And of course, there's access to justice problems here because employees quite reasonably may be unwilling to litigate because they fear victimization or problems getting another job. There are no longer um, status laws, of course, that um, people are treated uh, differently in law. The master no longer has a right to subject his male apprentice to corporal punishment. Um, yet in both these relations, there is clearly a power imbalance. And sometimes, even though it's not part of the um, law anymore, so, you know, we try to stop down on it, we hope, there is still, of course, we know a huge amount at this moment about bullying, sexual harassment, and the enforcement through violence. We've also got technological disruption. I won't say much about this. People are very aware of this and the changes with regard to paid employment, such that the nomenclature of employer-employee is kind of threatened as people uh, you know, move into what Guy Standing calls the precariat, um, his portmanteau term for precarious workers and proletariat to bring out the point that it's not sexy gig work that, uh, that we're looking at here, it's precarious living um, and uh, the loss of hard-won employment rights. 
And I kind of envisage, or in slight whimsy before I go on to the horrors of the marriage contract, but I envisage uber bosses in a sort of supervillain den in a volcano somewhere with a huge map on the wall in which they've got flags into the different areas in the world where they've got all of these court cases because it's going everywhere. And you can keep, as, as one does, a track on these things. So, for example, uh, you know, they've put a, a black flag where they, the Supreme Court in the UK has awarded some rights, albeit workers, so a bit of a fudge, but some rights there. Where Zubil is celebrating their campaign against California's Assembly Bill 5. And then obviously we'll have this, and, uh, and it's continuing by way of a struggle in the courts at the moment. And that's, of course, continuing with, you know, with that technological disruption hitting middle class jobs as well as uh, uh, others. Finally, moving to the marriage contract. The marriage contract has many features that are the same of both these others, and that's why I think Payton's interesting to pull them together. Oh, I've got something from Karen, but I bet I'll keep going and answer things at the end because I can't see it all. Um, and uh, so the marriage contract, the marriage contract has many features that are the same. It's a status relationship has gradually become more contractual and yet maintains its brutal origins. The marriage contract involves an exchange of consortium to give it a fuller definition, companionship, sex, birth and raising children and housework uh, for what was termed protection, housekeeping, money, material support. And this can end up with ha having um, two different levels of income within the same family. Um, like the social contract and employment contract, control within the marriage contract is sometimes played out through financial constraints, through surveillance, as we've got such an increase in that. Um, and we're due for some more regulation in that area, um, as well as potentially violence, even though, as we know about as well through the Royal Commission. Um, as well as in other places, even though it's it's not legal anymore to um, have husbands speaking wives. So in summary, pulling together these three sets of relationships, <coughs> sovereign subject, employer, employee, traditional husband, wife, they have in common that the role of the quote weaker party is created as a result of a political legal fiction, that of exchange of property in the person, which in McPherson is described as possessive individualism and is termed self-ownership uh, when it's employed by analytic Marxist Jerry Cohen. But it's the same thing. Um, in a 2002 paper, Self-Ownership and Property in the Person, democratization and a tale of two concepts, Pateman prefers to emphasize Locke's role in the history by referring to it from his term, uh, property in the person. It's a point, of course, made by Marx about the exchange of labor power or our capacity to work for a wage. Um, what Pateman's doing is adding the important missing term, uh, that um, is historically just associated with workers, married women's exchange of consortium for material support. Just like workers whose choice is often either that of poverty or subordination in the workplace, uh, there's still many places where women have little choice over marriage. Though of course, this has improved hugely as a result of women's struggles and their ability now to have lower exit costs and to um, improve working chances in the developed world. Working chances meaning paid working chances as opposed to unpaid work within the home. In this context, it's interesting that the position of workers now associated with greater freedom and status 
whereas it was historically a role that was associated with passive citizenship, given that you depended on another for your livelihood. So Kant in the Metaphysics of Morals, published in 1797, describes married women and barbers um, both as examples of passive citizens because their vote would be influenced by others to whom they owed their livelihoods. And of course, the roles of housewife and breadwinner were presumed and reinforced with the welfare state in the 20th century. Now, at this point, I want to look at Marx a little bit further. Um, and who can resist quoting um, from volume one, chapter six, when he describes the move to ground famously from the sphere of circulation in which labor powers purchased in what seems to be a just exchange for wages. And away from the sphere but below ground, Marx describes a change in the purchaser and seller of labor power. And I'm going to indulge myself and, and quote it because it's a great quote. On leaving this fear of simple circulation or of exchange of commodities, which furnishes the free trade trader vulgaris with his views and ideas and with the standard by which he judges a society based on capital and wages, we think we can perceive a change in the physiognomy of our dramatis persona. He who before was the many owner now strides in front as capitalist, the possessor of labor power, follows as his labourer, the one with an air of importance, smirking, intent on business, the other timid and holding back, like one who brings his own hide to market and has nothing to expect but a hiding. Now, Marx argues that the workers who have nothing to sell but their labour power only appear to be entering into an equal bargain by exchanging one commodity, labour power, their ability to work, for wage. It's in this area underground um, when they work. Marx describes um, surplus value being extracted, i.e. a profits being made on their labor because it's worth more than their actual wages that they're being paid. But instead of focusing on exploitation of workers, Pateman highlights the problem of subordination. And I think it's subordination that's central for her. And I'll discuss this further in the third section when I come to talk about freedom. However, it's worth mentioning a problem uh, with Marxist emphasis on exploitation that Pateman recognizes in the work of Jerry Cohen and which Cohen himself addresses and discusses in depth in his book, Self-Ownership, Freedom and Equality. Uh, so in her 2002 paper, Pateman points out that the claim that workers are exploited because of the extraction of surplus value depends upon their acceptance of the fiction of property in the person, that they own their own abilities as if they're commodities, and that the problem of exploitation is that they're just not paid enough in exchange for this commodity, their labour power. Surplus value is extracted instead. They're not getting the true worth of their labor power. And of course, this is the very fiction that Pateman's so critical of. And as Joe Cohen um, very honestly discusses, he says it worried him because and wanted to address it because it involves making the same assumptions as Nozick. And of course, he would want that. Uh, and Nozick, the the assumptions that Nozick made with regard to his arguments against most taxation. So Pateman's emphasis on subordination that she sees inculcated in the workplace and traditionally in the home uh, plays an integral part of her concerns about participative freedom and democracy that I'm going to discuss in a moment. But before I do, I just want to mention her thought experiment from that 2002 paper in which she envisages three different types of society. Um, she started writing, of course, society has gone in the wrong direction for her. 
uh, and I'd say for all of us in terms of the increase of, in terms of neoliberalism. Um, but I think it brings out something of the radicality of her work to think of these three possible societies in terms of how they, she envisaged them handling the fiction of property and person. So the first is the current one, or was current when she was writing, but yeah, current one, because we can't sell ourselves into slavery, so yeah. The current one in which property and the person as fiction is applied to the workplace and the relationship um, between traditional husband and wife, perhaps there's a question mark certainly over, over that in law. But of course there's limits about the, what can actually be treated as property in the person that can be commodified. So we can't um, sell ourselves into slavery. Um, that's, we can't treat ourselves in a commodity in that way. Um, so fiction of property of the person used in the workplace, but not in terms of some further thing. Um, that's the first type where we are now. The second is a society in which the fiction of property in the person's applied to more and more areas. And in other words, this is a neoliberal society in which more areas of life and human abilities can be commodified, uh, treated as if they're to be sold in the marketplace. Um, and there's some really interesting work around that about what happens to people like uh, Jane Radin, at uh, Titmus even, around what happens when you commodify these, these things. And we have a more recent one, um, Michael Sandel's book, What Money Can Buy, where he's talking about um, how more aspects of life, particularly in relation to sort of democratic life, are commodified in the US. But you can't sell it back into slavery, so we're not quite, you know, at that point, whereas Nozick would buy the bullet on that one. Um, so this is the neoliberal image of human beings as owners of their abilities. As David Brabers, an anthropologist, points out, people are much wackier, uh, more imaginative in terms of their motivations than neoliberals envisage when they talk about, or economists generally, when they talk about homo economicus. It doesn't mean that people are nice, of course. So he points to cultures where some people work to collect lots of money and goods and give them to their enemies in order to humiliate them. It's just that you wouldn't use the same sort of uh, assumptions as the image of Homo economicus. You could, of course, if you're gaming it, put in in terms of different um, different preferences. It wouldn't stop you doing that because, of course, giving your money away to somebody could be a preference. So, so. Finally, Peyton makes a radical comparison with regard to third society, um, thinking about what it would be to envisage a society without the political fiction of any <coughs> contractual exchange involving property in person that can't be separated from the human body. And this focuses you in on her three examples of these, um, these contracts. Um, with this thought of attacking the fiction of property in person, Peyton opens up a utopian image of a radical, radically altered society, focusing our attention on areas of life in which support donations have been inculcated and obedience learned and enforced on a daily basis. Because Peyton's thought isn't uh, only utopian, so the attack on property in the person as political fiction also allows her to think practically in terms of a sort of continuum, um, to think of pragmatic ways in which we may have step-by-step um, -step increases in our freedom by having a greater say in our everyday lives. And that moves me to the third theme here. In the introduction, I described the third theme that I've chosen as central to Pateman's work in the following terms, what's meant by freedom. And we're looking at Pateman's view of freedom as something positive, that you're free if you have a say in the decision-making that involves your everyday life. Pateman's view of freedom is easier to examine by contrasting it with that of Hobbes. In Leviathan 1651, 
He describes freedom in the following terms. You all know it, you can speak along. By liberty is understood, according to the proper signification of that word, the absence of external impediments, which impediments may oft take away part of a man's power to do what he would, but cannot hinder him from using his power left to him, according as his judgment and reason shall dictate to him. The sphere of freedom as the absence of external impediments becomes termed negative freedom by his own Berlin. You don't need to be active in doing it. It's just about being left alone. You can sit and watch TV and drink gin. And, you know, so long as you're left alone, you're not, uh, you're free. As Clinton Skinner's analysed, this represents a break from the civic Republican tradition. For Hobbes, it didn't matter what type of government ruled, providing you were not interfered with as an individual. Anne Phillips has illustrated the Republican response, quote, if freedom was simply a matter of non-interference, we might have to say that a slave left alone by a lazy or absentee master enjoyed full liberty, or that a wife cherished by her accommodating husband was as free as a bird, even when the laws of her society denied her any independent status. Servitude is servitude, even when the master's accommodating, the only free people are those who govern themselves. So in contrast to Hobbes, Pateman has a positive view of freedom that's integrated into the analysis I've just discussed. For Pateman, you're free if you can have a say in your everyday life. So you can see how this image of participative freedom draws on her linkage between sovereign subject, employer worker these days, precariat, traditional husband, wife. Um, Pateman points out that participative democracy requires that people develop the expectation and the social skills necessary to have their voices heard. In the workplace, employees turn up and expect to obey reasonable commands in terms of these implied terms in the employment contract that I've discussed earlier. Employees don't actually even have, think about having a say in their workplace. So Peyton's point concerns a lack of entitlement, but it goes further than that, um, because she's just saying without this practice, individuals don't learn the abilities that are required to join into this sort of decision-making process. And this overlaps with the later concerns about the impact of social media on discussions in the public sphere today. So the idea is that we learn these things that don't, you know, <laughs> which we actually have to have the experience and, and learn from them. Um, not just learning to have a sense that we should be entitled to have a say in our lives, but also the social skills of pulling together different arguments, looking from another's position, um, and producing uh, practical solutions as a group. I just want to say, if anyone else's inbox gets filled in with stuff about leadership, then this is really absolutely the opposite of what Pateman's talking about, because it seems to really um, glorify bureaucratic managerialism, whilst, you know, <laughs> um, being... Sadly, both, both funny and tragic if you really get these things. Um, and if you don't, tell me how you've, uh, you've avoided it. Um, the ways in which this issue of workers' involvement in decision-making has been considered, of course. And you can think here, even though you might think of it as utopian, as students often do, that the whole ways, once you're focused on this approach to freedom, there are different ways in which you can make incremental and pragmatic changes. So Europe having a go really with what used to be the bribing directive, having unions on the board. Um, admittedly, as Barbara Taylor's pointed out, and even the U New Jerusalem, I mean, we have had unions that were you know, racist and misogynist, but the hope is that uh, they improve. Another pragmatic argument that is really relevant, particularly today, and um, as a result of the pandemic, but also as a result of the radical changes 
in terms of increased inequality uh, through technology um, is that of a universal basic income at a decent standard. And she argues that uh, this necessarily affects democracy. So whether one, I suppose, guys standing covers all the ground, but uh, you know, where you can focus on individuals and the importance there of how it changes around somebody's life uh, through the experiments that we see. You think of the Stanford map, of a better map, a good a map for good, not bad, compared to the Uber map I was thinking about, where they've got all of the details of all of these, uh, of these experiments. And of course, Guy Standing's work as well. But Payton's focusing here not on all the other arguments, but specifically on this question of the impact on having a participative democracy. Um, so the idea is that a, a decent standard of universal income would help workers both within and outside of the home to avoid being trapped by bullies, by those who are violent, sexually or otherwise, those who are racist, homophobic and so forth. Um, but Payton's ambitions go beyond sort of um, getting away from abuse, which of course is very important, but she's also thinking more, more about the possibility of freedom that isn't just freedom from abuse, but also the freedom to have a say in the decisions that affect your life. Now, what I want to do briefly, and I recognise the, the time, uh, but just to compare Pateman and her approach to the social contract, I wanted to look at Jean Hampton and the possibility of the social contract procedure. So I'll be brief. So where's Pateman's critical of the social contract political theorists and their impact? Uh, some feminist philosophers and other philosophers, critical race philosophers, use the social contract device drawing from Kant. And these include Jean Hampton, Susan Morakin, adding gender to rules analysis, um, Charles Mills, racial contract, and batting for the continental side, Drusilla Cornell. Um, so I'll explain this position and uh, Pateman's view of the approach by focusing on Jean Hampton. And the background involves what she describes as two contract approaches to morality. Compared with Payton's focus on politics, Hampton's concern is morality. And she compares Hobbes with Kant. You can see who she's going to favor just by what, she, what she's doing. Um, so Hampton Hobbes that argues that Hobbes doesn't have a moral theory, but simply mimics one. Quote, one's concerned to cooperate with someone whom one cannot dominate. These want to behave in ways that mimic the respect that ought to be shown to her simply by virtue of her worth as a human being. In contrast to Kant, the idea of the social contract involves asking, are these laws we could all agree to if we were given the opportunity. Pateman kind of wants the opportunity, I think, if you compare the, the difference. This then confers legitimacy on the laws. For example, if a law is such that a group of people could not possibly have given consent to it, then the law's unjust. Kant gives the example of hereditary privilege to which the majority couldn't consent. Charles Mills, in the racial contract, of course, argues that nobody in the veil of ignorance could risk being black in the US in the era of Jim Crow laws. As Campbell said, the social contract is rather a mere idea of reason, albeit, albeit one of indubitable practical reality, obliging every lawmaker to frame his laws so that they might have come from the entire will of an entire people. So employed in this way, the social contract procedure or device is to basically ask, would free and equal persons agree to this? And since there's been doubt, note that in Hampton's reading of uh, Kant, this includes everyone. Um, Kant, of course, himself was 
viewed women as having animality and humanity, able to calculate their own interests, was a bit iffy about whether we had uh, uh, a grasp on morality in order to be classed as persons. But I'm taking what Hampton takes from Kant, which is this test to apply to everybody. Would freely persons agree to this? it for feminist ends. So it's useful to compare her use of the contract device or procedure with others. Rawls uses the social contract device as a one-off thought experiment to then detail what he would then find acceptable. In contrast, others have kept the question in play. Would free and equal persons agree to this? So Drusilla Cornell argues that the legislator and judiciary in the common law tradition should always think whether free and equal persons could agree to a new law or legal developments and exclude, exclude it if, for example, it produced gender harm or attacked sexual rights, the term she uses to include LGBTQI persons. Um, so it makes it a test for legitimacy of law in the way that she, re she wants it repeated at any point that legislation is being made or case laws being made. Jean Hampton uses the same contractual device and like Cornell, though not continental by any means, so she'd view herself very much analytic, um, but it shows the way that this distinction between the two can be broken down when feminists are focusing on a particular issue and drawing from a particular theorist count, which is interesting in that uh, that regard. Um, so instead of applying this repeated test to law, Hampton applies it to fairness in relationships. So she says, I want to propose that by invoking the idea of contract, we can make a moral evaluation of any relationship, whether it's in the family, and that's what she kind of seems to focus on, the marketplace, the political society or the workplace namely an evaluation of the extent to which that relationship is just. Her work draws on literature and anecdotes about subordination and practice that to bring home what it means to be treated as subordinate, particularly in terms of race and gender. And she chooses areas that are insidious, that demonstrates uh, how some, you know, lack that sort of, um, a sense of entitlement and others are brimming with this sense of entitlement. Um, note, as I'll discuss further, self-esteem, as considered by Hobbes, can fluctuate, whereas Kantian idea of self-worth is fixed and it's equal for everybody and it's objective. <laughs> um, so it's based, uh, it's linked with equal personhood. But you can mistakenly Hampton's falling Kant in this regard. You can mistakenly view yourself as being less worthy than others, but that would be an objective mistake. Hampton points out that some sexual offences can leave the victim survivor feeling that she can be treated this way because she's less objectively worthy of respect. It's then the duty of the courts to ensure that they're clear as to the objective equal self-worth for all people, which they're not doing desperately well at. And it's interesting side point that Spinoza runs, runs between these two, between um, Hobbes' fluctuation and the Kantian position of um, self-worth as being fixed, depending on the degree of adequate knowledge you have, which is such an interesting move lying between the two. To explain Hampton's position further, I'll focus upon her arguments in her influential paper, Feminist Contractarians, and I'll be quick. Hampton's paper starts by looking at the paradigmatic work of Carol Gilligan, focusing upon actual examples of moral reasoning. But rather than using an ethics of care, she uses it to demonstrate her Kantian approach. Just to give you an example of what she talks about, when asked the question, when responsibility to oneself and others conflict, how would one choose? 11 year old Jake confidently replies, you go, you go about one fourth to others and three fourths for yourself. And Amy, um, another 11 year old, this time a girl, 
says, and I'll go through it quickly because it's long, well, it depends upon the situation. If you have responsibility for someone else, then you should keep it to a certain extent, but to the extent that it's really gonna hurt you or stop you from doing something you really, really want, then I think maybe you should put yourself first. But if it's your responsibility to someone really close to you, you've just got to decide in that situation which is more important to yourself than that person. And like I said, it really depends on what type of person you are and how you feel about the other person persons involved. Now you can see if Amy and Jane get together, whose wishes are going to predominate on that one? Um, because Amy has difficulty putting herself first, even if the, the situation is really going to hurt her. And Hampton outlines this depressing stereotypes which may have altered, it's in the US in 1982. Um, so, you know, it may have altered certainly in, in certain societies, depending where you are. Um, but Hampton's argument is that what they need isn't an ethics of care here, it's a theory of justice, making principles. Um, so she follows Kant to the view, view that this morality is justified, of course, irrespective of any empirical change. And what she's doing with Kant is a really interesting emphasis. She says, morality depends, of course, that you treat everybody as having equal self-worth, as if they're free and equal persons. And that includes yourself. And we're so used to thinking of it with regard to, um, you know, the position where somebody's favouring themselves. You don't normally think of that move of somebody who's not treating themselves as having equal self-worth. Um, and she comments using literature that in some cultures women are brought up to think that they're special kinds of people for whom morality involves always putting others first. And she says always doing that is a problem. If it's coming from lack of self-worth, and if it's producing a society in which women are not given equal self-respect. She's not saying it's always women who make this mistake, but she's seeing it as, as gendered. So Jake and Amy, she says, both make moral mistakes that are the mirror image of each other. Um, I'll try and be quick. At this point, Hampton shares Peyton's political concern as to who has a voice in any relationship. She derives it from an abstract moral position rather than a political analysis. So she doesn't have those practical um, graduated arguments that, that, that Peyton come up, comes up with in terms of increasing participative um, democracy and freedom. Um, so I ask, what are the applications of Hampton's work? Um, and I want to just look at the, the question that she comes out with. She keeps one element of Hobbes in this Canton inspired test, saying that we're not under any obligation to make ourselves pray to others. And so she characterizes herself as redoing a Kantian perspective, just emphasizing that self-interest that comes out of the will wisdom of the egotist that uh, around um, self-worth rather than self-esteem that goes up and down as something fixed. So she comes up with the test, given the fact that the, we're in this relationship, could both of us reasonably accept the distribution of costs and benefits, that is the costs and benefits that are not themselves side effects of any affective or duty-based tie between us, if we're the subject of an informed, unforced agreement in which we think of ourselves as motivated by self-interest. Um, so she's taking up this social contract device of would free and equal persons agree to this. For Pateman, and I'm speaking in Pateman's voice, though she's not talking about Hampton, but just from what she says about the social contract device, the problem is that Hampton replaces politics with morality. As a result, the test removes any consideration of historical development of status relations into contract and abstracts the problems that occur. As such, it doesn't put the sort of uh, suggestions that, that Hayden has. Um, and it's that concern 
around abstracting from historical circumstances. Um, and I suggest that uh, Pateman's test is not really something that can help an individual on their own, but could provide material for consciousness raising group, for example. Well, Hampton's moral test is necessarily severed from its historical roots as she views morality as objective. It must be noted that she does so with an acute eye. She describes the nuances of the ways that such relations of subordination are managed in her arguments. And she does so with attention to images. Um, she says differences and disagreements amongst people who are supposedly in the same philosophical camp shows that contractarians are united not by a common philosophical theory but by a common image. Philosophers hate to admit it she says but sometimes they work from pictures rather than ideas and it's with these pictures I think Hampton draws out the psychological implications of daily negotiations and compromises within employment and marriage both of which are, are changing. <laughs> Sorry I went a little over there. Well, thank you so much, Janice, for that wonderfully rich uh, paper. I see that uh, Karen already has a question in the chat. So, Karen, I'd invite you to turn on your microphone, please, and ask your question directly. Uh, okay, so um, I, just at the end, you sort of uh, contrasted Jean Hampton and Carol Pateman in terms of uh, Pateman having been more kind of historically accurate in some sense. Um, but the work that I've been doing, I mean, I, I now feel that this feminist critique of social contract theory is based on a very distorted history of social contract theory. Uh, of course, all the social contractarians that we re read are men. So we read, you, know, you, you talked about Hobbes and Locke and Kant. <laughs> Unconventional the, like that. <laughs> but during, I think during some, the 18th century, during the 18th century, when uh, the real movement uh, from, well, towards uh, democratic republicanism took place, uh, Hobbes was not an influential figure. I've just, um, I, so the person I've been working on is. Catherine Macaulay, who of course we haven't read because the mm -hmm. uh, institutions in which we were brought up only got us to read the male texts. Now I think that once you start to look at the female texts, all of these questions about um, the social about the marriage contract, the interaction between the marriage contract and 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 the so and the political contract, they kind of well, they change and 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 so my question is really, you know, <laughs> um, and, and I guess one other comment, you know, the the Macpherson and the idea of possessive individualism, it's almost as though Macpherson, because he's a Marxist, sort of wants to go to the weakest point of um, social contract theory, but it wasn't Hobbes. I mean, Hobbes was, Hobbes was a monarchist, you know. Sure. <laughs> Catherine Macaulay is yeah. arguing against Hobbes because she's a Republican and, and there is nobody talking about Hobbes in the 18th century, except really for Catherine Macaulay critiquing him. So it's a very, it's, it's a completely distorted history to think that somehow Hobbes is at the origin of Republican uh, democratic social contract theory. At least that's what it looks like once you start reading the women. I am very sympathetic to your position. I love that because I just keep finding, I mean, recently somebody said to me, oh, well, of course, rules said that, you know, women talked about women, you know, everybody gender neutral under the veil of ignorance. And it, how easily uh, feminist critiques, Oakin's critique, Gets, gets lost and they just credit him with, with you know, uh, having that view. Uh, and it so gets distorted. So I'm very sympathetic with your project. And I was very grateful that you sent me, I was waving, uh, uh, oh, you can't see because of the TARDIS, but um, 
something about uh, your your two papers that you sent. So I think that it's an extremely worthy project. I'm entirely with you uh, about actually um, looking at the position of uh, these women writers who who get lost. So I'm totally with him on this. Um, and actually, one argument that I think may be coming through because I still I, I still stand by my paper and I think it's because we've got um, I'm interested in the arguments about political and moral theory that are coming through here um, I don't obviously it's very important that we have a reworking of history that brings in women's voices but nevertheless I'm interested in what Pateman thinks of in terms of freedom and around the, the political issues. Now, what strikes me as being an interesting philosophical question here that lies behind what you're saying isn't just about the history of the uh, social contract and what's the definitive sort of social contract, but about how we think about uh, political philosophy in relation to the history of political thought. Um, your position strikes me as being, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems to me that it brings out um, a sort of Cambridge School type approach that you're saying, you know, these sort of arguments can't be right because you're emphasising the wrong, the wrong people historically. Um, and I don't want to lose Pateman's arguments. And also, I don't think she's wrong. I mean, I've read your, your papers. I, I was um, very excited to get them. I'm totally on board with your project, which I think is brilliant. Um, I don't think that you're saying that Pateman's got Locke or Hobbes wrong, as it were. I think you're saying that's what's been ne neglected are other voices. Is that right? Well, I guess, um, I mean, it's an interesting question to what extent the history uh, impacts on, if you like, political theory now. I guess that insofar as um, one attacks social contract theory, assuming that Hobbes and Hobbes's possessive individualism is at the origins of the social contract theory that was developed in the 18th century, then we're attacking a straw man. Uh, I think there are problems with social con contract theory, but I think that if we want to understand what, uh, in fact, the Republicans were, what was motivating social contract theory in the 18th century, in the period which actually led to the development of, of uh, democratic republicanism, then we ought to be <laughs> criticizing the arguments. I mean, the, the real problem, I think the real problem is the problem in the Kantian tradition. That is the, the problem that there is something that any rational person would agree to uh, were they asked, because that assumes what Locke and Catherine Macaulay and the, the, these writers in the natural law tradition we're assuming, that is, that there is a natural law, that the, there is a moral law that is immutable and that can be known by reason. Now, of course, if there is such a, a moral law, then rational individuals left, as it were, free, will agree on what is morally acceptable. But once you, once you, get, once you get rid of God, once you get rid yeah. of, of universal uh, morality, or you know, immutable moral truths, as Catherine Macaulay would call them, um, mm. then it's just not clear that there yes. is anything that rational yes. individuals will will um, will agree on. And I think that is the sort of much deeper problem that we have in, if you like, with democratic republicanism now, that uh, you know, there isn't um, there isn't anything, as it were. There is we're not able to really kind of, uh, well, I mean, you, you, you end up with either kind of on the one hand, a sort of extreme cultural relativism or on the other, 
people sort of, you know, gesturing towards universal moral truths, but you know, what's the ground of these universal moral truths? So I think it's a much, I think when you actually look at the actual history, we have a much, <laughs> a much deeper problem. Oh, sure. <laughs> in a sense. Oh, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you on that as well. Um, the only thing I'm not, and actually I would go to Spinoza for this, um, but that's, yeah, that's quite a long Spinoza. point. I just want to go, I just want to go. I mean, where does reason Sorry? come from? Spinoza, Spinoza also has, a, has an idea of a, a rational world. I mean, basically it's- Oh sure, but it's an embodied rationality. It's not a Kantian rationality. Doesn't it's not a faculty. Um, so you increase your powers of acting, and it's also got the trans individuality in terms of how that occurs. But there was, I mean, I'd like to talk obviously about Spinoza, but I'd better just say, I don't think Pateman, um, the emphasis here is on Hobbes as, uh, as the person she's arguing most against because she's seeing him. Um, as actually sort of letting the cat out of the bag with regard to equality in the state of nature. It's Locke and it's Locke and the public-private divide that she's particularly about. Um, yeah, but, but Hobbes... So, anyway, look, I think we should let somebody else have a go. I just oh, right. <laughs> but I have to say, uh, yes, I, wel I welcome that. And I do think it's such a vital thing to do in terms of bringing to light what gets really closed down in terms of women's work. And that tends to happen in all sorts of spheres. So, for example, in art, you know, they, they're actually sort of either um, seen as not not part of the the general thing they you know they're always kind of outside for some reason but the reasons seem to differ all the time but it ends up with the same result and it's quite remarkable to see this across different subjects you know in, including the history of political thought thank you both that fascinating conversation that that's given certainly me certainly a lot to think about i, I wonder if i might use my chair's prerogative to, to ask uh, one further question, which I, I fear may have to be our, our final question, Janice. Um, I, I was just thinking of, of sort of moving on from the, um, the theoretical concerns to, to where the rubber hits the road today with some of these um, ideas. Um, I was originally going to frame the question as, as, is the social contract still a useful concept in public discourse to make visible the sort of things that you've been raising, or, or is it too compromised and laden with baggage? But perhaps in, in view of what Karen was saying, I, I would say which social contract is yeah. useful for us today, would you say? I, I, I'm sympathetic with Pateman's attack on it. Um, it and, and actually the, the point that, that Karen made now about how we, I mean, with respect to, it was on your website about Christianity, if you don't have that, which I don't, I don't think you can go along the Canthampton line. Um, and I don't think, as I was saying, even though I think it's very clever, um, and it's a really interesting use of, of, of the contract and this idea of perpetually asking if free and equal persons could agree to it, if only you know, we could get the judiciary and the legislature to do that. Um, but of course, what Payton would say is, instead of having people co continually thinking, what would free and equal people think? Why can't we ask them? Why can't we have some <laughs> a participative democracy that's red-blooded, that doesn't have people that are just taught subordination in the workplace and often, you know, has been the the home. So it's a more radical reach. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I will have to uh, draw things to a close there. Let me um, thank uh, our presenter, uh, Janice Richardson. We, we're not able to thank her audibly, but in, in whatever Zoom appropriate way you feel, please do thank uh, our presenter for such a rich paper and, and a wonderful interaction. Uh, at the end as well. Um, that was fantastic. Our next seminar uh, in the Social Contract Research Network is on the 1st of June at Melbourne time, and Professor Peter Holwood, uh, 
from Kingston University in the UK will be speaking on Rousseau. Uh, his title will be The Most Absolute Authority, Rousseau's Divided Legacy. And I look forward to seeing you again there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, participants. Thank you, Janice.